Well, good afternoon on this Thursday, February 3rd. Yes, we have some beautiful weather out there today. Looking over, this is actually the view from Timberline Lodge looking out at Mount Jefferson. Absolutely gorgeous out there today. Gotta love that. And here's what's happening today. The Vancouver Police Department is thanking the community for their support following the death of officer Donald Sahoda. We can tell you plans for a memorial service are underway. Also a goal to cut U.S. cancer deaths in half by 2047. The White House relaunches cancer moonshot. You can hear from a local researcher who advised the president on the initiative. A new education bill is on the docket for Oregon lawmakers. The proposal would allow more parents to choose how their child gets their education. And we begin here with breaking news at this hour. A volunteer firefighter hurt while battling a barn fire this morning has died from his injuries. Our Christelle Kumwe is live in St. Paul where this fire happened. And Christelle, you just got an update from the fire department. Yes, I did. And 30 year old Austin Smith lived in St. Paul. He had been a volunteer with the St. Paul Fire Department since early 2015. We just got a photo of him. The fire started at about four this morning. Firefighters say there was an explosion at the barn shortly after they arrived. That's when Smith got hurt. He was airlifted to OHSU in critical condition. Mark Daniels with St. Paul Fire Department says the loss of Smith leaves a hole in this very tight knit community. Our hearts are broken and uh, uh, he will be sorely missed and and it's felt very very deeply in our in our community here. Austin leaves behind a, a wife and extended family here in St. Paul. As of right now the fire is still under investigation and there is no cause yet released. Live in St. Paul, Crystal Kumwe, back to you guys. All right, Crystal, thank you. Well, if you were driving along I-5 in southwest Washington early this afternoon, you may have noticed first responders holding a procession for fallen Vancouver police officer Donald Sahoda. A beautiful show of support for the officer and his family. A short time after that procession, the Vancouver police chief spoke for the first time since the shooting death of one of his officers, something that he has called a devastating blow. Mike Benner is live outside Vancouver police headquarters with more from the chief. Mike. Well, good afternoon. The police cruiser you see behind me is sitting outside of police headquarters to honor Officer Don Sahota. Although off duty and at home at the time of his death, Officer Sahota was acting in the capacity of a police officer when he was killed, so his death is a line of duty death. The first for this department since its inception in 1883. As you can imagine, the mood here is somber. Chief James McIlvain saying that Officer Sahota's death has been extremely painful and emotional for this department as well as the greater law enforcement community. This has been a devastating blow. Vancouver Police Chief James to... McIlvain speaking for the first time since the shooting death of off-duty officer Don Sahota. Don's family is in my thoughts and prayers. Officer Sahota was shot and killed Saturday night. You might recall Clark County Sheriff's deputies were chasing a guy suspected of robbing a convenience store. That guy, identified as Julio Segura, ditched his getaway car and ran to a nearby home and started banging on the door. The home happened to belong to Officer Sahota, who was off duty at the time. Sahota and Segura got into a fight outside. Segura, we're told, actually stabbed Sahota multiple times, then tried to get inside the house. That's when Clark County Sheriff's Deputy John Feller showed up, and he fired several rounds from his rifle, striking and killing Sahota in what appears to be a case of mistaken identity. Chief McIlvain said Officer Sahota worked in the Vancouver Police Department's training division, impacting the lives of so many. The chief then shared this statement from Officer Sahota's wife and kids. While police officers are heroes, they are also human. Being a law enforcement family, we understand that this is one of the hardest jobs in the world, often involving split-second decisions that mean life or death. We would like everyone to know that we hold no ill feelings toward the Clark County Sheriff's Office or the deputy involved in this tragedy and hope others can show them grace as well. 
All right, the family goes on to say that Officer Sahota's death lies squarely on the shoulders of that robbery suspect, Julio Segura, and that is a sentiment echoed by Chief McIlvain himself. In the meantime, we can tell you that Officer Sahota's memorial service will be Tuesday, February 8th at 1 o'clock at A. Lene Casino in northern Clark County, and more details on that will be released in the coming days. Brittany. All right, Mike, thank you. Well, I was fortunate to be able to advise the president and his team about this reignition of the cancer moonshot. That local doctor right there, and he's a leader in cancer research and treatment, but he also helped President Biden with a new plan to fight cancer. OHSU's Brian Drucker assisted the White House in the relaunch of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. It aims to cut the rate of cancer deaths in half by the year 2047. Our Tim Gordon talked with the doctor about what this means going forward. Tim. Hey, Ashley, Dr. Drucker, you know, he's the director of OHSU's Knight Cancer Institute, and he's known worldwide as an expert in the fight against cancer. Drucker is 100% behind the president's plan. It's bold, it's ambitious, but it's completely doable. The Biden administration's moonshot with a goal to cut the U.S. cancer death rate in half or more in the next 25 years. We already have our sleeves rolled up and we're ready to, to work as hard as we possibly can. It is a lot to shoot for, but Dr. Brian Drucker says the science already in place paves the way for even more life-saving advancements. We're just seeing this remarkable renaissance of technology that can be applied to the problems for early detection, for prevention and treatment of advanced cancers. You put all those together, you accelerate progress. I think this is an achievable goal. And there is another important goal of helping those with cancer and their families manage the difficult experience. And one of the things I'm pleased that the Biden administration is focused on is helping patients navigate that frightening experience. And you think the, the three most fearsome words are, you have cancer. Three words said far too often. Cancer currently kills 600,000 Americans a year. But Dr. Drucker sees great hope in new early screening methods that catch cancer more easily. The OHSU Knight Cancer Institute is working with one company that's developed a single blood test that can detect 50 different types of cancer at early stages. And think how revolutionary that would be if you could go to your doctor once a year and have a blood test to screen you for cancer and that it democratizes the ability, availability, accessibility because it makes it so simple. And the moonshot includes a big emphasis on new effective prevention and treatment options. The HPV vaccine already guards against cervical and head and neck cancer. And Drucker says mRNA vaccines like those used against COVID can now be applied to cancer. By doing these things and more and cancer as we know it. Exactly the Knight Cancer Institute's goal all along and happy to share it with the Biden administration. We are quite pleased that they've, they've taken our, our tagline to end cancer as we know it, and we're in this fight together. I remember Joe Biden led the first moonshot against cancer back in 2016 when he was vice president under Barack Obama. But that initiative was killed by the Trump administration, Ashley. All right, Tim, so this time around, though, we are, of course, in a pandemic. So how will that impact things? Right. Well, we mentioned some of the scientific advancements from COVID that can help. But in terms of cancer screening, you know, this has been really tough. A lot of people went without in the past couple of years. And Drucker actually estimates 10 to 20,000 Americans lost their lives because they weren't getting screening mm. during that time. So that is definitely something that they'll want to get on top of and get screening going with a particular focus on underserved and rural communities, Ashley. Sure. OK, important stuff, Tim. Thank you. Tensions are mounting in Oregon's capital. Days after lawmakers came to Salem for the short session, Governor Brown weighed in on which issues they should tackle. Maggie Vespa joins us. And Maggie, the governor's state of the state address today really zeroed in on housing and creating jobs. Yeah, Brittany, it did. And there's also now a growing consensus among her critics that the governor's remarks had one glaring omission. They note she failed to address the surge in violent crime. A little history here. This is Governor Kate Brown's last state of the state before 
term limits force her to step down next year. It comes amid the short session in Salem, as you said, where over the next month, lawmakers will be hammering out a long list of budget items. And as we said, the governor named her own list of priorities. Among them, job creation via one specific and high profile package. Future Ready Oregon is a $200 million package that invests in job training with a focus on three key industries in need of skilled workers, healthcare, tech and manufacturing, and construction. Now, the governor also called on lawmakers to pass a $400 million funding package aimed at building more affordable housing and tackling the housing crisis. She also trumpeted Oregon's COVID policies. The state's mask mandates, of course, are among the strictest in the nation. As we said, Republicans in particular are hammering the governor for failing to talk about the surge in gun violence and crime. Oregon Senate Republican leader Tim Canope writing, crime is at record levels here in Oregon, but you wouldn't know that by listening to the governor's speech. He added, people don't feel safe and Republicans share their frustration and anger. The lack of urgency Democrats have brought to this crisis is shocking, end quote. We reached out to the governor for comment, but no response yet. Guys, back to you. All right, Maggie, thank you. Oregon lawmakers will be looking at more than 250 bills in this month long session. One of them is a proposal that would give more parents a choice as to how their child gets an education. Christine Pitawanich explains. Right now in the state of Oregon, once a school district has 3% or more of its students enrolled in a virtual public charter school outside the district, it generally can start denying requests. School districts get thousands of dollars for each student, which helps funding for public schools and is the main reason the cap came into existence. But some parents say the cap takes away parent choice. Our oldest daughter, she was uh, being bullied at school. So Danny Zimmerman tried to enroll his eighth grade daughter in a virtual public charter school. I hit send within 10 minutes of me hitting send. We got the denial. The district, Lincoln County Schools, confirmed the denial was due to reaching the 3% cap. Zimmerman is not alone in his frustration. I have a lot of constituents email me about it. And Oregon State Representative Jack Zika, who represents Redmond and the surrounding area, is sponsoring House Bill 4119. The bill, what it does is it just removes that 3% cap. A similar bill is also in the Oregon State Senate, but those in support of keeping the cap cite lower graduation rates and poor educational quality. In a statement, Oregon Education Association President Reed Scott Schwabach wrote in part, raising the virtual enrollment cap also creates incredible instability in our state's ability to guarantee the resources our students need to thrive for Oregon's public school system. Officials at public charter schools say the 3% cap, which came into effect more than a decade ago, is obsolete because technology and the pandemic have changed online learning. I hear from families, uh, multiple families a week, honestly, about the um, being denied. They say students in one district may not have the same choice as students in another. Those are the unintended consequences is that we have created inequitable academic experiences for our students in the state. As for Zimmerman's daughter, she was eventually able to enroll in an online public charter school, but only after her family went to great lengths to establish residency for her in an entirely different district. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News.